I had my period for three and a half weeks and it was heavy continuously. He wanted to treat it with just like the pill um, and see if that would help, um, which it did for a little bit, but then the pill became ineffective. When I changed my pill, um, things did improve with our relationship. I noticed my moods changed. I started taking testosterone uh, in March last year. Um, at the end of May, I had appendicitis and had my appendix out. He was like, there are no signs of endometriosis, there are no red or black dots, so whatever you're doing must really be working. I went on to Zolodex mm -hmm. and it's at the age of 16 and I was able to kind of get some of my life back. It gave my body a break from that horrible cycle of just daily pain periods. The experience is like you're on menopause, so you get hot flushes and you get really bad mood swings. At the moment I'm on the Zolodex um, injection, which I've had for the last four months now. Um, in two months time it will run out and um, I won't actually be able to have any more. So I'm not quite sure how we're going to manage my pain after that. So I've got 20 minutes to talk to you about medical management, so that's really a lifetime for you guys. So I'll try and make it as brief as I can and talk about the principles. So I think I'm just reiterating what lots of people have said today, and I think most of those girls there today have said a lot of what I'm going to say as well. But it's really important to try and minimise disease progression because what we really are important about, I'm a fertility specialist, I'm an adolescent gynaecologist, so looking after people's future fertility is of course a very important role for me. It's really important to control symptoms and I think not one person in this room would say that you can't have surgery all the time, it's just not going to be feasible, but it is important to get that balance right. And I say to lots of my young girls that I see that I'm not going to be able to make you pain free and I wasn't here for the pain session this morning, um, but what we're trying to do is make life bearable so that you can attend your daily activities and have a good quality of life. Medical management can't cure the disease but it can try and make life better. And it's all about menstrual suppression and trying not to have that endometrium shedding. And it's really important also to minimise the side effects of treatment in that process. And I spend a lot of my life talking about the menstrual cycle um, because as we all know, um, that's what, what makes this disease happen and that's what we've got to try and control. I think of it in two halves. The first half of your cycle is oestrogen based and you get oestradiol being produced as the follicle develops. We're all born with all the follicles we're ever going to have. And so each month you've got about 10 or 20 that try to grow up and FSH is follicle stimulating hormone. That's what tries to grow a follicle. And then LH, that surge you can see there, is what then makes us ovulate. And cycles where you don't ovulate or I see women who have got blockages, they're going to get shedding of the lining back into their, into their pelvis and that is where things all start from. So the whole point is to try and either have no lining growing up when you're trying to treat it or to keep it in that second half of the cycle like we see there where you've got both oestrogen and progesterone to keep it like um, so that it's there and not shedding. Okay, So that's what I'm trying to keep the basis of. So we're trying to suppress FSH and LH and I'm trying to talk you know, um, we know we all talk medical languages, I'm hoping we can try and get that down. So the history of treatment came by looking at the, the states where endometriosis was better and I think when I'm talking about putting people on the pill and not having periods, many people go, well, is that's not natural. And I go, well, if you think about our grandparents, our grandmothers, they were either pregnant or breastfeeding and they had very few periods and when you look at them, um, it was rare that they had endometriosis because they were multiparous and they often weren't having periods. So it came down to these amenorrheic states which were either described as pseudo-pregnancy or pseudo-menopausal. But as you saw from the videos and what I'm going to describe, they obviously have side effects associated with them. So when you're fiddling with hormones, you're trying to control your endometriosis by suppressing ovarian function. And really how well you suppress will relate to the effectiveness. Um, so what we're talking about is the HPO axis. So Hypothalamic, hypothalamic pituitary ovarian access is too hard to say all the time. So you've got your H, your P and your O and that's what you're trying to influence. And so when you're trying to do a pseudo-pregnancy state, you're trying to give oestrogen and progesterone to keep you in that second half of the cycle and then not have the period come and the menstruation to be shedded. 
when you're looking at being um, looking at centrally, you're trying to act up here higher to turn everything off, and that's the Zolodex people were talking about. So there's various types. I've just listed them here. I think you're all going to be familiar with them, but we use progestins a heck of a lot to try and turn things off. We use pill preparations, which is estrogen and progesterone. And I know when I met Sylvia the other day, she said, why do we need estrogen when endometriosis is, is estrogen dependent? But you actually need some estrogen to grow a lining for the progesterone to act on, which is the second half of your cycle. And that's why, and being low on estrogen is not a fun situation. So that's why we often do need some estrogen with progesterone, which I think people need to be aware of. The central suppression is your GnRH analogues. I've really just mentioned Danazole for historical reasons, and I'll talk about that shortly. Um, when I went back and looked at all my textbooks when I tra trained in the 1990s, Danazole was just about all we had. We didn't have Zolodex. Um, and there was other things that obviously we still had the pill, but they did it in a different way. And aromatase inhibitors play a small role. So I think you know there's many different ways you can have progestions. There's many different oral ones. There's the intramuscular depot, which is depot provera, the subdermal implant, which is implanon and the intrauterine system, which is Mirena. And I've just listed the proper chemical names of, of them there. Um, most of those are, are available as orals, but some of them come as the uh, others as well. So levonorgestrel is what's in the Mirena, the intrauterine uh, uh, system. The subdermal implant is actually the etonorgestrel. And we know that high-dose progesterone will have a direct effect on dampening down endometriotic deposits. And that's like we see in pregnancy, where you get decidualization and maturation of the, of the endometrium. Uh, and they can suppress ovulation, but not as well on their own as a combined pill. Problem is, um, when I think of, when I'm talking to people about the menstrual cycle, I think of estrogen as good cop and progesterone as bad cop. I think we all know about PMS. I won't ask any of the men in this room, but anyway. Um, but, and that's, I guess, the reason why I think progestins you know, you've got to tailor it very much like we said, and I think I would agree entirely with Charlotte. We need to work with you to work out what works best for you. Um, and so, you know, a lot of breakthrough bleeding is a big problem, constipation, and I know Cherry's spoken about uh, trying to split the, I spend my life trying to split gynae and gastro symptoms, and it's really difficult. Headaches and sore breasts will also be um, progesterone type side effects. If they're androgenic and, and have male side effects, that doesn't suit some people. Um, and acne, weight gain, and oily hair is, you know, a lot of my patients don't want that. And so some of the newer ones, uh, Gestadine and Dynagest, are not as androgenic and they're going to give us a bigger range of what we can offer people. Mood disturbances, uh, particularly uh, anxiety and depression, can be associated. So again, if I've got someone with a history of that, I might steer a different way. And loss of bone density with prolonged use, I think it's more with high dose and particularly with the depot. And so I don't like using that, particularly in my young adolescent group, when you haven't put down your peak bone mass, I get a little bit concerned from that point of view. Because your intrauterine system is going to be lowest dose, it's obviously going to have the least systemic side effects and I believe it grows up the lining the least as well. So it does, it's a very effective form um, of treatment and can be used in conjunction with other things. As I said, the oral contraceptive pill is both oestrogen and progesterone. They say in the books you can use it cyclically or continuously, but I can tell you most ONG registrars have about one period every six months. So we mostly practice what we preach. Um, it, but how far a person can go before they get breakthrough bleeding is going to be incredibly different for every person in this room. And that's, what, that's why I'm, what I mean by hormone fiddling, trying to work out what works for each person. Um, and if you get breakthrough bleeding, Often, you know, sometimes maybe you've got to have a five-day break and restart because otherwise you're trying to have a period and the pill's trying to stop you having a period and you'll just keep spotting and I, that's not going to help your symptoms. So the literature shows that there's no one formulation that's superior to another and you have to balance it out. Um, and I, you know, I, what I've done, the next slide will show you, is, is there are so many different types of pills on the market, you can fiddle with it. And I'll often add progesterone to the pill as well if I'm trying to get that balance right between oestrogen and pro progesterone. And as I said, it acts by reducing menstrual loss and trying to keep you with that endometrium there with both oestrogen and progesterone on board, but then not let it shed and come away. And you'll get less bleeding into the endometriotic deposits elsewhere in the body as well. 
Some people think that by, you know, they say with endometriosis, oh, you're not on a strong enough pill, you need a stronger pill. And so they up your dose of, of uh, estrogen. But in my books, being a pharmacist, the more estrogen you have, the thicker the lining is going to grow. Um, it will mean that you have less breakthrough bleeding, but then when you do get a bleed, it's going to be more painful. So I think there's got to be that balance. And there's no one right answer for anybody. I haven't listed progesterone side effects again here because we've done that previously, but obviously you need to take a family history and make sure that someone's not at risk of a family history of, of deep venous thrombosis. That's the number one thing with oestrogen, um, and I do always take that history, and then we obviously have to tailor it if there is that risk. When I started practice, ethanol estradiol was the only oestrogen I had, and it's a synthetic oestrogen. We now are lucky enough to have some natural ones as well for people that get symptoms with sore breasts uh, and nausea so that I can tailor it according to that. So this is a new one that's around. So estradiol is 17 beta estradiol, which is what the ovary produces. So this new pill is trying to mimic the natural oestrogen. Uh, no magestrol is, is a newer progesterone as well, uh, but it's actually a little bit what's in, in Implanon as well, very re closely related to that. But it, but it is a very low dose pill, so some people will get breakthrough bleeding with it, but if you've got someone who's sensitive, then it may well be a good option from that point of view. Um, the next preparation down, Clara, is actually probably the only cyclic one I use because it has a very good bleeding pattern and it only has two sugar tablets. So if I've got someone who on continuous gets continuous bleeding, then sometimes I'm better off doing a cyclic one that only gives them a day or so of bleeding. And, and so it's a phasic one. And that's got the Dynagest, which is also in Vasan, um, as you're aware. So it, it's a, a good, less androgenic progesterone. And then you've got all your ethanol estradiol preparations, 20s, 30s, 35s and 50s. Um, and they're mixed with a whole lot of different progesterones as you can see. Um, some of them are older, levonorgestrel is, is a little bit more androgenic, but sometimes, you know what, that suits people and it gives them good uh, control. So, you know, it is certainly something that I use and it, with Femtech, obviously cost comes into things as well and there's very few pills that are on the PBS. I think the government thinks that all women are alike. But, um, they're not. Um, and so all the newer ones, they're, they're not on the PBS. And so you've got to try and tailor it. I work in Western Sydney, so I've got to tailor it to what my patients can afford as well. Um, so, you know, and then Yaz and Yasmin, all that was out in the paper as being the one that was associated with DVTs. Really, all pills, are, it's the estrogen component that's associated with DVTs. When you look at newer progesterones versus older progesterones, so a woman's risk of DVT not on the pill is about two, two, two cases per 100,000 women years. On the pill, it's five to 10. And your older preparations with levonorgestrel will be down the five end. Your newer preparations such as Yaz, Yasmin and Marvelon will be up the higher end. But it's a gradation, it's not a yes or no answer, okay? 35 microgram pills, um, Brevenor and Norriman are, um, are pills that are available on the PBS, so they're helpful from that point of view. Norethistrone is an older progesterone, but it's meant to have a very good bleeding pattern. But I find 35 microgram pills, people talk about more discharge, um, more headaches and, and things like that. So Pridorone acetate, which is Diane, Juliet, is still, uh, there's a thousand names. Um, but uh, I find I don't use that one if I've got a history of depression. I find it is a particular difficulty with mood disturbance. Um, it is antiandrogen. It's great for acne. So you've got to tailor it to your person and see what they need. Microgram and 50, I probably only use in the setting where I've got epilepsy, where you do chew up your oestrogen, and therefore you do need something a bit higher. I tend not to use it. If I need to dampen down breakthrough bleeding, I tend to use a lower dose pill and add a progesterone to it. But hormones and pills, you've just got to tailor it to the person. I put this slide up again just to say that this time I'm talking about GnRH analogues and acting at a, a, a central level. Uh, and that's the Zolodex people were talking about, the injectable preparation. It can be, there are other ones which are daily injectables, but most people do a monthly injection. And it suppresses your FSH and LH secretion directly. Um, and gives you a low estrogen um, state. It really does give people a good amount of relief and a lot of my patients love it when they're, they're on this preparation and do worry about what they're going to do when they come off it. Um, uh, but it does cause menopausal side effects. So it's really great, isn't it? You choose whether you want to be pseudo-pregnant or pseudo-menopausal. 
<laughs> but you know, so you have to try and see what you can do. There are things we can do to help with some of those side effects. Um, but, uh, and like I say, you can even give a small amount of add back estrogen. So if, if, if GNRH analogs is what works, it becomes expensive after six months because the PBS will only allow you a six month course. But you can add back estrogen in afterwards, which the real reason for doing that is to try and minimise the bone density loss, but it's also to try and relieve the menopausal symptoms. Danazole is a synthetic steroid, which as I said I've mentioned for historical reasons only. Uh, it's androgenic, it's anabolic, it causes alterations in liver and lipid profiles. I don't think I've used it for about 15, 20 years, but, um, and it gives you hyperestrogenic, so it gives you everything. Uh, and I therefore think there are much better drugs available today and much better systems and ways of, of taking it. Aromatase inhibitors, um, people might be familiar with this, that sometimes it's also used for, for breast cancer as well. Um, it blocks androgens to being converted to estrogens and therefore does give a pseudomenopausal state and is good for deep infiltrating lesions. So again, like Zolodex, it has a, a small role, but it does have significant side effects, um, which is menopausal and your bone, bone loss. And you need to be on the pill as well, because otherwise you can develop ovarian cysts, which you really don't want to be having more activity in your ovary. I then just mentioned a couple of other things that are not hormones. So cyclocapron is an antifibrinolytic agent which reduces bleeding. And so if people have got breakthrough bleeding or spotting, or when they actually have got their period, it reduces the flow. You only need to take it when you're bleeding, but it's a good adjuvant role and can be used safely. They used to say it had a risk of DVTs, but the literature does not support that, so it's a very safe medicine as well. A lot, haematologists use it a heck of a lot in a lot of settings. And neuromodulators, I'm sure, were touched on this morning um, in the pain management session. But again, I'm just putting them in there as the, for neuropathic pain. It's part of medical management and have an important role in addition to the hormones. So in summary, I'd like to say that you do need to individualise treatment and it needs to be a two-way dialogue between yourself and your treating um, physicians. Hormone fiddling really is important because one size does not fit all. And what we're trying to do is, is optimise quality of life and minimise side effects. And I'm a great believer in a multidisciplinary approach. That's the way we um, approach it at the Children's Hospital and we balance surgical and medical treatments. And you know, really what you're doing at the time, Children's Hospital obviously is pain control, um, but it depends on your desired outcome. And so pain and fertility, you've got to keep that in mind and where you're at. Thank you. <laughs>